Let me first introduce myself. I'm Leonard Housing. I'm the chairperson for the foundation uh, that I founded together with Ahmed Arad and some other people um, to help the government transition into a more open software environment. So why would we, would we want to do that? Well, we've been thinking about what is keeping the government from not getting into open source. And I think that this is basically what we want to say. I think that you all already are pretty much convinced that open source might be a good idea. So I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to try anything in terms of, of convincing anybody of the, the value of open source. Um, if someone wants to make that, uh, have that conversation, I'll, I'll be, uh, not be around today, but undoubtedly we'll meet some, at some other point. I have to apologize as, as well as uh, Breno did uh, for the Dutch slides. Mine have Dutch everywhere, so you have to get used to that. So, not preaching to the choir. Let's see what, we, what we, we really have to focus on in terms of getting the government to make that transition. Let's accept that it's necessary. I think we've basically got the politics, right? We've had this first motion in Parliament, in the Dutch Parliament in 2002. And you can argue about the value of that and um, about what that exactly means, but the political side of it, when, whenever we want to have any decision in politics, it mostly goes our way, yet it doesn't happen. So something else is going wrong. It's not the politics of it. There's definitely more of a problem in terms of getting the government, the, the the, the ser services to transition, and there's quite a number of g pretty good reasons for it, I think. I have to get, grab my notes here so that I don't skip over anything. Um, we've seen a couple of, of, of interesting reports. There was this contested study that was halted by Ms. Minister Donner at the time. Uh, it was called Sorry, We're Open that was concluding that it would save a lot of money for the government and there was a really weird report by the, the Rekenkamer that uh, concluded that no, really there's nothing going on there, open source doesn't do anything. Even this year, uh, I think it was in, in January, a letter came from Minister Block um, that said, well, open source, that that's, sounds nice, but really, if you transition into open source, you're still dependent on a single, uh, a single supplier a lot of the time, and, and also uh, if, when you're, whenever you're in a procurement process, then still you don't, uh, there's not a lot of money that can be saved at that point. And he's right. He's completely right. It's really hard to make, a, make the case that open source will be cheaper if you are at the point of buying something. So let's say you're, you're a civil servant and you need to procure your, your, your organization some, some, open, uh, some office. It'll be very hard to make the case that legal office will be cheaper at that point. It's not about price. It's about freedom. Uh, it might very well be that it's about freedom. I, was, I, I said that I wasn't going to make that point and I know the arguments. We all know all the arguments and I agree with all the arguments. Let's not make that case. Let's try to make the transition right now. That's what we, what we need to do. So, but there's a bigger problem here. The government might want to buy open source. The politics, uh, politi politicians might say they need to buy open source. But there's still one really big problem for the government. And that it is it can't buy open source because open source is not being offered to them. We don't have the infrastructure for open source. Now, I'm going to skip over this one. Right now, about 80 percent, I, I don't want to, this is a general, general figure, there's only a couple of companies that basically get all the ICT contracts. Why is that? Because they know how to win government contracts. It's the only reason. They have some knowledge about how to do that. And this is not really all that hard to do. It's just something that we don't do as a community. We don't go in and, and make sure that the government has this 
proposal lying uh, ready to, 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 uh, to procure. We're really bad at this. And that's a shame. Because we already have been convinced that we need this for our freedom and for our, our uh, pocketbooks probably as well. Better for us. Oh, huh. got this one twice. What I was going to say here is we need to start sowing because the ground is already fertile. We as a foundation, we've been talking to a lot of people in government. Everywhere, from the local level to, the, to the, um, all the services around the government to, to even slightly outside of government, where, where you're in the hospitals or, or whatever. Everywhere there's people, plenty of people that say, yeah, it doesn't sound like a bad idea actually, when you explain to me the reasons that we should do this transition. They want to do it, they, they don't mind doing it. But then they say, well, it's, it's crap though, huh? Open source, complete crap. So we have a few problems, but the ground in, in itself is fertile, and you can easily point to all the good examples of the, where, the, where open source is already making a, a huge difference in the world. I'm not going to have to convince you that open source is, in essence, a much better platform to do all your work on, and that is, in a lot of the times, companies are already using it in enterprise mode. It's not a problem, not an inher inherent problem. So we need to start feeding this hunger that the government really has but is not really aware of and is not really pushing hard to make a change in. And it has to be us. And we have to start creating the, the, the situation where the government will have not even have the choice not to do open source. You know, there's a wonderful thing about the, about the government. It has something called a procurement law. And the procurement law basically is not really very good and it basically favors the status quo and, and the big companies. But it is a law and it has rules and it's really something like code, uh, like, like programming. You can, you can hack it. And I think that we are really good at hacking things. And if once you get into that law, then you see where the, where the problems are, the reasons that we are not very good at, at, at using that law, but you can also see where the opportunities are. And there's plenty of opportunities. Now this, this law, that sa it says, for instance, that you have to be of a certain size to uh, be allowed as a, as a supplier to the government. And a lot of open source companies are simply are not that size, or they haven't been around long enough. Or they, they, there's all kinds of reasons why you, as a company, might not be able to supply your services to the government. And so instead of learning how to change that dynamic, a lot of open source uh, companies don't even try. Or they go through these, these gatekeeper companies that have the ability to, to get these, uh, these uh, big jobs and then they hand out the leftovers to the, to the open source companies, but that also doesn't build an infrastructure where we can win this thing. But this thing is winnable. Because this law is a fixed thing, and we know how it works, and we know what we can do exactly when, uh, when an, uh, uh, the government says, some organization here says, well, we, we are buying some new Microsoft Office. They do that. You can't do that. If there's an alternative product on the market that is as good and as, as flexible and as versatile and cheaper, then you can't, the government can't say that it is looking to buy Microsoft Office. But nobody's challenging it. So what I would like to propose is a couple of things. We as a community, we are very good at working together at, at building code. Why don't we become good together at getting government jobs. This is just a, a question of organization, which we are very good at. A bit chaotic maybe sometimes, but generally we, we can do things. And it's a matter of spreading knowledge around, which is definitely something we're very good at. The only thing is that we, we seem to be 
holding off on this particular development. So we're looking for companies that are willing to make a change and that are willing to, to, to change this dynamic. We need to start organizing, as, not as a single company, as one of those big ones, you know the, 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 you know the ones that are winning those co government contracts. We can remain small and still be big, like bees organizing themselves. In Africa, bees will scare away any elephant because they're working together, because they know how to do it. They've had huge projects in Kenya where they handed out bees to, to farmers so that they would stop killing the elephants and the elephants would just go away of their own accord. And the, the farmers would have honey as well to sell. So it was a win-win situation. So let us be the bees. Let us use the law and, and, and this, the rule of law to our advantage. Let's find ways to do that. And we, as a, as a foundation, we are ready to, do, to start doing this. Once we have, right now we are, uh, a foundation that is excellent contacts everywhere in government, we have no money. Because we don't accept money from commercial partners. So, once we do get the money, and once we uh, can start building on this, we, what we are proposing to do is build a fund and have that, sorry, have that fund um, start litigating. Once we see projects where, where we see that the government is not playing by the rules, itself, it has set itself, we will challenge those rules. We will challenge those practices. And we will make sure that there is room for uh, open source alternatives to come in. If those open source uh, alternatives are there and if we have suppliers that are willing to do it, that are willing to step in and organize themselves and get in there. And we are willing to organize, to help organize the consortia that we should form. We should start making groups of companies that together do have the power to, to get those government jobs. This is not a very difficult thing to do, it's just something we need to start doing. Now I don't know if you know what the price is, the price that we could win here. Uh, to, 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 to just forego the whole freedom discussion, which I completely agree with. I completely agree with. But just the money. Just look at the money. It's billions of euros for the Dutch government alone. That we are leaving to, to, to feed into a market that is working against freedom. Now, I was supposed to say some things about privacy as well, and I, I think it's an important thing. Because open source is about the government's independence, right? It is about getting it to, to function, to have control over its own decisions, and not be co-opted by commercial interests. Definitely. Privacy is about that exact same thing, but then, for me as an individual, and in order to have my privacy, I don't have to make this argument that Breno has done it much better than I could uh, before me. But in order to have it, we need open source in the government. Because if I want to have my privacy, then they have to be open about how they use my, my data. Now, I've been working in, in the European Parliament for a couple of years now. Um, one thing I've been involved in, not very directly, but on the side, has been the, the reform of the data protection regulation, which is going to be in effect in 2018. That's not going to be very good. This guy made it. He wrote the parliament side of it. He's a very good friend of mine. He's Jan Albrecht, a um, very, very capable politician, but he has to, do with, has to deal with the way that politics works. And politics simply works non-binary. Politics is the opposite of binary thinking. It's always about a compromise. And there's just not very much compromise between zeros and ones, is there? So, he has to build compromises and 
really this field doesn't lend itself for compromise very well. Now I want to make caution you here a bit. This regulation is about data protection. And data protection is not about privacy. It's a different thing. Privacy is about what you don't know about me. Data protection is about how do I treat the things that I do know about you in a right way. So, because I'm trying to, to squeeze it in a bit, it's a bit, uh, I'm a bit um, lost in my whole stream. But I do strongly believe that, oh, this one is broken. <laughs> If we want to treat our government, um, we, we want to allow as a, as a community to, to get better ICT. That's the general thing. Better ICT is open source and better ICT also allows us to organize some things about our privacy. And I think that as a community we should come together, not only to get, the, um, get those government jobs and start helping the gov government get into open source, but we could use that same power to go beyond what the data protection regulation is going to demand of the government and make sure that best practices are put in place that we know work to protect the privacy of our citizens. Now I want to share something with you that's a bit outside of the context but I think it's important that you know this, that you understand this. The general data protection regulation protects personal data and personal data is those data that are um, traceable to a specific person. Now this doesn't need to be identified data. It doesn't have to be data that you can put a name to directly. It could also be data that has the name dropped off and, and it's replaced by a number and then it's pseudonymous, pseudo, uh, incredibly difficult word, pseudonymous data. Pseudonymous data, I think it is. Um, but there's a third category of data and it's anonymous data. That doesn't exist. It doesn't exist from the point of view of the data protection regulation, which says it's simply do whatever you want with data that you cannot tie to, to a specific person. But that's a, just a general, a, a disastrous loophole because we the world is starting to realize that anonymous data does not exist and that it will, data will be re-identified at some point. Always. And there's a, a, a horrible, horrible example shown last week in German television. I don't know if anybody see, has seen this, but there was, there's this, this wonderful open source group that creates this, this, this wonderful plugin that you can put into Firefox. It's called Web of Trust. And it's, 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 it's fantastic because it tells you exactly which web websites are, are, are doing things right and which websites are not. And so they warn you if you are getting into a zone where you maybe your privacy might be compromised. That's a good idea. Only problem is that Web of Trust was selling all your surfing history to commercial partners. Anonymized, so don't worry about it. So the German television started a company in uh, Israel, a fake company, and started looking for data to buy. And they got a free sample set. They were actually, for one month, they were attached to the, to the fire hose of, of this data stream. And they could see exactly, three days later, they could see exactly what three million German people had been looking at on the web. And it turns out that if you have the URL, and you have an ident a global identifier, then basically you have the guy or the girl. You know who it is because your name keeps popping up everywhere. So they found politicians and they found this, this guy who is a, is a chief of police somewhere who turns out that he, is really, uh, he really likes to beat up girls in his spare time. Things like that came up. Um, and this is only uh, this is data that was poorly anonymized because there were still names in it, so that it was really easy, easily identified. Still, it was sold as anonymized. C 
even worse than that. So the problem is, is, is way more complicated because I'm, I'm willing to bet that in five or ten years with the whole Internet of Things thing, which the government is going to go massively into, even the, 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 the fucking data from the streetlights is going to, to give away your privacy. You're going to know things about you because you started tapping water at a certain point. Um, whatever, there's so much data that they'll, they'll start to zone in on you immediately. So we have to think about as a community how to include that with our mission to, to uh, get the government into open source, how to get the government into responsible um, best practices about the way that you uh, use data, collect data, not collect data, whatever. That about the data. There's a couple of things that we've been doing. Am I gonna, do I have, still have time, Ahmed? Yeah. Not keeping time? Shame. I'll have to do it myself. I'll try to wrap it, wrap it up. I wanted, just wanted to tell you how we are uh, proceeding to do this as a, as a foundation. As a foundation, we've been starting uh, several projects or uh, adopting several projects. Uh, one of them, this, is, this one is uh, adopted. It's called Playo. Is anybody familiar here with Playo? Not that many. Okay, Playo is, is something that was built by a couple of civil servants from the um, Belastingdienst, from the tax office. And the tax office, these guys just said, we want to have a better collaboration tool for, to work together with, with people from across the government. Right now about 350,000 uh, civil servants are, are working with this. It's the default uh, platform in, in several uh, provinces. And it's being used in, in, in municipalities and it's even being used by just ordinary people because it's open and it's open source and it's free and it's pretty good platform. Support is pretty poor. Um, customers are starting to complain about how they should proceed and it's not professional enough. Fair, fair points, but it's still <coughs> innovation coming out of the government. So we're trying to, to help those people find better ways to, to monetize and, and to uh, create um, a more professional platform that will pay for itself and will be better. Uh, and in the process we want to make it even more versatile, more uh, complex and we have been working together with Red Hat to, uh, to get a better, um, easy, more easily uh, implemented platform for, for this. We're also working on, a, on, a, on an idea that we had back in 2013 that we need some sort of um, focus device that we could have for, for this transition, to build this tra transition around. And I think we found it in, in the idea that you can now use your smartphone as the bit, pretty much the replacement of that. Most people still have this on their desktop, right? But you could throw away one of those devices, get rid of the computer, bring in your smartphone. Your smartphone is a computer. People are still are working through, uh, through their beautiful desktop computer to get, get onto uh, Citrix anyway. So why not use your smartphone to do that? It could. The smartphone is not open. Some smartphones are. Listen. You can limit yourself indefinitely and, pr and, and propose not to do anything until it's perfect. I agree that there's a lot of problems there. I completely agree. I can't solve them. So I'm focusing on the things that I can solve. And I can, I can focus on the things that I can do to bring, uh, bring us on a path where we can fix these things. And what I'm proposing is get a smartphone, use it to get onto Citrix. I hate Citrix, but it's there. It's the, it's, the, it's the way that we are working right now. And then we can build on that. Because once we have that, we have this awful environment where we, where we use, for instance, a Ubuntu smartphone uh, to get into Windows. And we can do we can have those civil servants work just the way that they were used to yesterday and we can make them work in a new way today 
save a lot of money, free up that money to uh, invest in improving the system and start building on this beautiful HTML5 platform, use that to um, migrate all the applications to. Now I know that Ubuntu Phone isn't 100% open source. Fuck that, it's the only thing that there is. That's a, no, you don't. You actually you, you get rid of a lot of them, yeah, and you don't need any new ones. There's not one place where you need a new license. No, you keep some licenses. You don't get rid of all the licenses in all all in one go. I agree. But there's not one new license that I'm I'm introducing here, except an open source new uh, license. So I, ref I, I resist that. And it's, really, and it's a really narrow-minded vision of open source and, and the path forward to keep focusing on the perfect world. That's never going to happen. And by doing that, you're limiting yourself, you're limiting the, the community, and you're putting us on a path to nowhere. So, and I'm doing this for free, right? So. There's no, there's no corporate interest behind me that, want, that need me to say this or something. Anyway, I'm closing off with, um, with Larry Lessig here. Code is law, he said. And he, he, it's really important to realize that, that legislation, the way that government works, and ICT have become completely integrated. These things are becoming inter uh, interchangeable. It's, 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 in, it, it, it's impossible to get them out of each other anymore. So we need better information, better ways of co making sure that the code is doing what we want it to do. We need to start investing in that. We need to help the government get on that transition path any way we can without compromising our ideals but making sure that we get closer to them. Thank you. So, questions, I think. <laughs>